right, in this video we are going to be covering the vacuum system and the associated instruments as well as some principles of gyroscopes and some common errors. So you'll see here um, on our screen we have a simplified diagram of your typical vacuum system that you're going to find in a light GA aircraft where our two main instruments that we're concerned about that are going to be running off the vacuum system are going to be the attitude indicator and the heading indicator and it is driven by the engine driven vacuum pump. You can see through this plumbing here it is pulling air through the system through our vacuum air filter up through the lines to the back of the, uh, the gauges and then these gyros themselves have little veins on them which are um, is what the air is pulling over which is causing it to spin in the different um, axis that it's mounted in and then back through the plumbing and uh, overboard the vacuum relief valve just prevents too much um, pressure from being built up and then we have our suction gauge which is red inside the cockpit there to make sure we have the appropriate amount of suction um, this draws air through the system uh, and, and it can spin the gyros up to 18,000 rpm so they go incredibly fast and you can hear it whenever they're winding up. It's actually a really good indicator that you have an issue with one of your gyros is if you turn the system on and it sounds abnormal, you will get used to the, the sound that your gyros make whenever they are working properly. With the vacuum system's two main instruments being the attitude indicator and the directional gyro, we also need to be able to understand the principles of uh, gyroscopes. And these gyroscopes rely on um, two fundamental properties which we are going to discuss, the first of which being rigidity in space. And rigidity in space, um, pretty much as you can see from this graphic, we have our gyro that is spinning in one set um, axis and as long as it's gimbaled where it can move freely it will always stay in that one turning axis and everything else will essentially move around it. So you can see with this gyro here spinning in this direction the flat disc it will remain spinning in that same direction but our base will continue to rotate around it this is essentially the same thing in our other instruments. Um, you can think of that gyro is spinning and the aircraft is flying around that disc. The other principle that we're going to talk about with gyroscopes is going to be that of precession. And uh, precession is the tilting or turning of a gyro in response to a deflective force. Um, the reaction to this force doesn't really, it's not going to occur where the force is applied, but it's going to occur 90 degrees later uh, in the direction of rotation. So you can see in our gyroscope here, um, the plane of rotation is going downward on the screen. And if we had an applied force to the top of this spinning gyro, it's going to be translated 90 degrees later through the plane of rotation. So that force was applied here at the top, but it's not going to be felt until 90 degrees later with the plane of rotation. And so that will result in the force going this way. And that is the plane of precession. Right in the first gyroscopic instrument we are going to discuss is going to be the attitude indicator and this is powered by the vacuum system. Um, the gyro and the attitude indicator is mounted on the horizontal plane as you can see here and it is relying upon rigidity in space for its operation. So you can imagine since it relies on rigidity in space as it's turning in this horizontal axis right here it's resisting all other change so the aircraft is essentially flying around that and then it corresponds to our uh, face of the gauge itself. 
Our next instrument we're going to talk about is going to be the heading indicator or the directional gyro. Its power source is also the vacuum system for this discussion. And the heading indicator or directional gyro relies on the principle of um, rigidity in space as well, um, but also suffers from precession. Uh, the important thing to note about the heading indicator, which is opposite than that of the attitude indicator, is that our gyro here is spinning in a vertical plane. The aircraft is actually rotating around the rotating gyro, not the other way around, which is what we discussed with the attitude indicator. Um, and because of precession caused by friction, the heading indicator creeps or drifts from a heading to which it is set, which is why every now and again you need to check your heading indicator and fix it. Um, this is why we use that adjustment knob and we check it before we do every flight. We bounce it off of our whiskey compass. Our next instrument we're going to go over is also um, our last one that relies on, uh, it's a gyroscope, but it has its own power source. It's um, electrical, it uses DC power. And this is due to the fact that we need a redundant backup. Um, you know, if we had all three of the instruments, the attitude, directional gyro, and the turn coordinator, relying upon vacuum source, and we lose vacuum, it's uh, not a good day. So our turn coordinator is a gyroscopic instrument, but it relies on its own source of power. And for this discussion, we're only going to be referencing a turn coordinator. Um, to note that there is a difference between a turn coordinator and a turn and slip indicator. And that difference between the two is the canted gyro, the angle at which the uh, gyro is canted. And you can see in this one, um, it's typically 30 degrees and it's angled like this. And that allows the um, turn coordinator to show roll rate. The turn coordinator is uh, canted, therefore its gyro can sense both rate of roll and rate of turn. 